This episode of the Music Production Podcast is sponsored by Kits.ai, a platform for artists, producers, and fans to create AI voice models with ease. AI is quickly becoming a powerful creative tool for musicians, and I think Kits.ai approaches it in an ethical way. They have a royalty-free library of voices, and Kits.ai also works directly with artists who license their voices and have control over how their likeness is used. You can upload your own voice and Kits.ai converts it to the artist of your choice. I created a short piece of music to try Kits.ai with. Here's the music with my voice. Living in a dream, dream in and here it is with an AI voice, Ariz. Living in a dream, dream in the light. This voice is Devin. Living in a dream, dream in the light. And this is Kira. Living in a dream, dream in the And here we all are together. Living in a dream, dream in the light. And here the voice is solo. Living in a dream. Dream in the life. The whole process only took minutes and I was able to add some new dimensions to my music. It was a lot of fun and I think there's a lot of creative potential with this. Check out kits.ai to try it for free. Hello everybody and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host Brian Funk and this is the show about all things making music. And on today's show, I have my new friend, Peter Bell. Peter is a guitarist, musician, songwriter, producer. Um, he's got a great history um, playing with all kinds of people. Um, played on Bonnie Raitt's first record, the James Montgomery Band. He teaches at Berkeley. He's the author of Creating Commercial Music. You might know some of his music from shows such as This Old House or New Yankee Workshop, where he wrote the themes for. He's the winner of Emmys and ASCAP Awards. Um, and he's a cool guy. I got to spend a lot of time with him uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, we'll probably get into that a little bit. So I'm really happy that you're here, Peter. Nice to see you, and great to catch up again. Yeah, it's great to see you, Brian. Um, I'm most proud of being a cool guy out of all those things. <laughs> <laughs> That's not easy, right? <laughs> Coming from you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well. Um, yeah. We had a ball out there, huh? Yeah, so... So people know uh, we went to Monterey, California on a songwriting retreat, and I really didn't know anybody. I knew Matt Jones, who was actually on the podcast, like, I guess, almost a year ago, talking about the first edition of this Monterey songwriting retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of knew Matt, but um, yeah, it was kind of like, uh oh, where am I going? What am I getting involved in? And the first person I met was you, and mm -hmm. right away, kind of put to ease, you know, uh, picked That's me nice up at the airport hear. and uh we kinda... yeah it, it was a leap of faith for me as well yeah um if you ask any of my ex-wives why well would peter <laughs> go to a songwriting you know collaborative uh gathering of any kind they would say no way not in a million years <laughs> <laughs> but i took i took the leap and i really really uh glad i did i met a lot of really nice people and we made nice music and you're one of the nice people i met yeah well we were roommates so that was kind of fun right yeah we got to stay in quite the place um right on the pacific ocean and that was a treat and uh it was you know as a roommate you were great so that it wasn't spoiled <laughs> by that any kind of weird uh well, you know house I situations was in a good mood <laughs> sleeping next to the waves and yeah you know, it was it was hypnotic yeah, it really was. I mean, that's inspiring right there. Yeah. Yeah, but I was the same way. Um, I was definitely a little nervous and apprehensive and, you know, it's comfortable just to stay home. Mm -hmm. But it was a great lesson for me in uh, taking those chances, stepping out of your comfort zone. And um, as I got there too, I felt kind of like looking around at some of the people after talking to you and some of your experience and then, all the, everyone else, I'm kind of like, what am I doing here? <laughs> How did I get involved in this? But it was so much fun. I think we fun. all felt that way. Everybody has imposter syndrome in those mm -hmm. situations, you know? Yeah. 
I think I really took away, though, that the one thing every one of us has, and, and that goes for anybody, really, I guess, is that you are the expert at being you. Mm. <laughs> There's no one that can do a better Pete Bell, right? There's no one that can do a better <laughs> Brian Funk. For than, better or for worse. Yeah, <laughs> but that's, that's yeah. I just found myself leaning on that. <laughs> I said, if there's anything I can do right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did a good job. Everybody loved you, Brian. It was uh, hands down. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and we had a great time. And also, um, we had performance night, and I got a chance to get you to play on a song. Uh, that, was that was cool. Yeah, it was one of my band songs uh, called Where'd My Heart Go? And uh, simple chords. And, uh, and uh, after hearing you play a little bit, it was like, I got to get Pete to play some music with me. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah, really. The whole good thing was so fun. Uh, you know, it was, um, uh, I, I knew Matt because he had been my student, uh, which is how you met him too. Was he mm -hmm. your student? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I, I had initially arranged to meet him in person, uh, right at the height of COVID. And, so we literally met in a you know at a coffee shop next to berkeley standing in line and all of a sudden he almost passed out he felt faint and it turned out he had covid so um he had planned a big dinner for all his uh teachers and and classmates and all that had to be canceled and mm. so i didn't know if i was ever going to see him again mm. and then because you know co by coastal and uh, then he sends me this invite, and um, it just happened to be a good time for me. I was going to California to see my new grandson anyway. So, uh, and the timing worked perfectly. So I spent a week with you guys in Monterey, and then I went down to LA and met my new grandson. And yeah, it was all perfect. Yeah, congratulations on that. Well, How did that go for you? Oh, it was really cool. Yeah. And um, I already had a granddaughter, with on that side of the family for my son and his wife and she stole the show she you know <laughs> my my grandson was he's in the beanbag stage where yeah where, right. you know he's just a baby but she was in, extremely charismatic and and you know definitely you know uh had everybody eating out of the palm of her hand it uh -huh. was really fun yeah, yeah she, she's got to work now right she's got a little competition <laughs> that's right that's right and she's up to it believe me yeah oh that's so nice <laughs> yeah. do you think uh it was the timing that got you to just kind of take that leap it was part of it yeah i mean i was going to be in california mm -hmm. um so uh and also i like matt he's a great guy yeah 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 matt's a really great example of somebody that that has first of all so much enthusiasm right mm -hmm. um but you know for all the classes i've taught now for berkeley very few people stay in touch and i really do try to encourage that and you know we don't have to say that i don't have to say at the end like let me know what you're up to send me your music right. you know right. um that's not part of the contract <laughs> right mm -hmm. but um very few people take you up on it or at least me maybe it could be a, a me thing but Matt well, was I've always one too. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Matt was, you know, that's something I, I love to see in somebody that's learning and um, to take advantage of that, that there are people that are doing this because they want to help you and they want to be part of your journey and see what happens. And teaching is one of these weird jobs where you kind of don't even know if you did it right at the end of the day. You don't you i joke around with my students sometimes where you know they leave the room and like nobody looks any smarter to me <laughs> <laughs> but if i cut my grass i can see like it's cut it's clean it's yeah, neat right, right. like there's instant feedback but you don't get that and i think a lot right, of teachers yeah. long for that you know that's part of why i think we get into it is mm -hmm. you want to know that you, you you're making a difference and you want to see people grow and blossom and um, it's it's. I just want to say that to like anyone that's a student of music and has mentors or teachers, um, like they want to hear from you. Yeah, I think, they do. On, on they the do, large and majority. they deserve to too because they work hard. Um, I actually reach out <clears throat> to some of my students because I enlist them to collaborate on 
productions. Hmm. So when I find somebody that is exceedingly uh, talented, in my view, um, subjectively, uh, then I will often uh, invite them to do a track together. And I find that that's very rewarding. Mm. And I've been um, surprised and delighted by how um, positive the response has been. Everybody wants to do it. Yeah. And uh, it's it's really fun. I'll, I, at some point during this talk, I'd like to play you a couple of examples of, of uh, ex-students that I've collaborated on uh, tracks with. Yeah, that's great. Oh. Yeah. You want to yeah. start now? You want to just jump yeah. in? Yeah, sure. Since we're there. This is actually a, uh, a picture of my studio, my home studio. So I'm sitting in this chair here. Mm -hmm. um, and very cool. It looks very mobile. Looks like you move things around. And I, put every, I put everything, everything. On, on wheels because I recently took everything out of the room uh -huh. uh, in order to have the floor refinished. Mm -hmm. And so it was such a lot of work that I put everything on wheels and now I can clear the room out easily. Yeah. I like that. Um, you know, one of my favorite pastimes is reorganizing the studio. <laughs> you know, when I don't yeah, want to. I notice that you have all those cool lights, man. I got to get some of those lights. <laughs> Those are neat. Yeah, I think that helps me a lot to kind of forget about everything else in life, <laughs> to set the mood a little bit in the lights. <laughs> Why else do we do music, right? Right. <laughs> um, okay. So this is uh, an, an ex-student of mine named Ashia Yuri, um, who's in North Carolina, and she's an exceedingly sweet and freakishly talented vocalist. Mm -hmm. Um and this is a long song. Should I play the whole thing or just a, an, ex, an excerpt from it? Up to you. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to play the whole thing, but I don't want to bore your listeners. No, no, no. They can skip ahead. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's about go. five minutes. <laughs> Don't sound too good 
Okay, so (laughs) that was done totally remotely. Hmm. Um, I don't know where the drummer played his drums (laughs) because he was in Germany somewhere. Oh, cool. uh, When he added his part, his name is uh, Vansel Cooper. The the bass player is Jesse Williams, who plays with the um, the North Mississippi All Stars and many other people. Um, plays a lot with Duke Levine, who's Great now with part. Bonnie. Yeah, and um, the uh, the horns were performed by Bruce Nifong, who was the head of the ensemble department at Berkeley for a while. Um, and I played the guitars. That uh, that sort of show offy little uh, solo break um, was basically Jesse's solo. And I liked it so much that I asked him if I could copy it and, and play it with him. Hmm. And he generously allowed me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. that's the kind of thing that um, I'm up to. Was you, your student the singer? The yes. Vocalist? Yeah. Right. And Great vocals. Great she recorded too. her parts in North Carolina. And um, it's so easy to do collaborative uh recording this way because it doesn't matter uh what daw people are using um i'm gonna guess that at least three daws were included were 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 involved in this particular production so i was using logic and uh jesse was using what's it called sonar or uh, something that runs on windows and um and i think uh, Shia was using uh reason hmm. um and bruce was using logic too vansel was i'm i'm pretty sure using pro tools but basically we render everything as audio files and that way the sync gets preserved and all you really need to do is start with something that's in time and then everybody else can follow it uh, mm-hmm. particularly if you play to a click because then they can sync up their click to your click. And it does make things uh, just a little bit easier. If there's if you're doing something Roboto, where the time changes a lot, then it's trickier. Because mm-hmm. um, uh, people have to, to, to learn your tempo changes. Um, but it's still very doable. And you just definitely don't have to all play at the same time because that tune nobody played at the same time. Hmm. Um, so I I really like working that way. That's one of the one of the uh, my dogs are going crazy. <laughs> Hazel, be quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Saying you forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, you know, but that's that's one of the wonderful things about this uh, technological revolution that we're in mm. this you know the, um, golden age of production. Even though I'm one of those people who likes vinyl and I I like tubes and mm. I, I like the sound of tape, but um, the the potential for working with people in other cities um, or even across town without having to be in the same room is just to me, it's miraculous. I just love it. Yeah, it's pretty close to magic. <laughs> when... It is. <laughs> and I'm sure we're going to do something together at some point, Brian. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I hope so. I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was really cool. And it sounds very cohesive. It sounds like people playing together. It's tight. It it's, you yeah. know, I'm sure that speaks to the caliber of musicians that you're working with. Um, it, Somewhat does, yeah. Yeah, I have, great, I have great one point. more, but we could talk for a while first if you want. Yeah, so. no, um, I, I just think it's so cool. I really loved um, the harmonies and some of the percussion was so yeah. melodic. So you know? some of the arrangement and the, the, the percussion parts were originated by another student 
uh, mm-hmm. s- somebody who took my jingle course. I, I teach a um, uh, writing and producing music for advertising online mm-hmm. and uh, for Berkeley and um, and um, he has gone on to. You know, I'm not sure that I have permission from her to use her name. It's probably okay, but but um, she has gone on to get a a gig with a big time New York uh, jingle house, and so she's off to the races at this mm-hmm. point. But she's another person who I was just gobsmacked by her talent. And when you know, when I find somebody like that as a student, I just want to make friends with them and make music with them and. Mm-hmm you know see how they're doing and keep in touch with them just like you're talking about mm. and so if they don't reach out to me i reach out to them sometimes it, it you know sometimes a student will be um reticent to reach out to a teacher because they they don't want to you know uh they figure there's a boundary there but um you know uh i'm with you i like i like it when people reach out yeah it's it's so much about music is making relationships, getting to know people. It's one of the things I try to stress in my class that what separates this from going on YouTube or reading textbooks is that you have each other. You're working together through the same things and the same struggles and there's bonds that can form through that. Yeah. Yeah, that really is. In fact, <laughs> uh, this is random factoid uh i don't know if i i think i might have been in california i don't know if we talked about this but i was reading this article about a harvard researcher that they were studying happiness Hmm. um and she was doing her phd phd thesis um at the uh, uh the behavioral studies department in harvard and they did a lot of uh, I'm not sure what they, you know, uh, uh, parameters they used, but they did a lot of research. And she said the the one factor that makes people happiest the most is getting together and working with other people towards a common goal. Hmm. So I think we're on to something here. You know yeah. what I mean? You remind me of a book I've taught. It's a book we would teach to seniors. Um, uh, Into the Wild. Um, oh, yeah. You mentioned that book out in California. Did I? Maybe. maybe um, yeah. wonder what, we're in the wilderness or something there. Yeah. But he, um, you know, he decides, you know, he got the Ivy League uh, education and he left college with money in the bank, which is like unheard of these days, right? <laughs> and decides to take his car out somewhere in like the desert abandon it burn his money and just go live like uh off the land into the wild um and something that does happen throughout the book is he does make relationships he's a loner and he does sort of just suddenly pick up and leave but there are points where he makes friends and relationships uh but he winds up in alaska and where he dies eventually yeah he didn't Um, survive right he didn't make it um but there's Uh, he got too far away from people yeah he got he wanted to conquer the wilderness you know jack london like (laughs) sort of thing and i i guess he just uh you know that's tough first of all i think maybe he ate like poisonous berries or something oh but in his journal you know he's chronicling all this stuff and he writes a line in there happiness is only real when shared like while he's alone that's right that's and fantastic. It, he, 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 basically, he's saying, "I made a mistake." Kind of, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, sure, it must have been amazing on a lot of levels, and and there's an allure to that, you know. And I think, especially when you're like a teen oh, you and bet. you're, you know, you're yeah. ready to leave, and you don't want to just put on a suit and go to your cubicle right away. I know. But then there's that. That's, you know. That's that's real, you know. I think I watch a movie that's really funny. I don't necessarily laugh out loud unless I'm with other people, and it's uh-huh. just something about the shared experience. Yeah, I I think that that's true when I watch sports too. If I'm watching the Celtics, 
or the Patriots all by myself, I don't yell and, and, and cheer. <laughs> right. But when I'm watching with other people, I always do. Yeah. You get hyped yeah. with them, right? Good point. Hmm. You know, I, I just uh, th thought I would give, uh, take a chance before I forget and say that the the, the young lady that um, helped me with that arrangement is named Carmen Thompson. And, hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think that she's going places. Hmm. That sounds she's great. Really cool. Yeah. Hmm. She's the one who came up with that triplet figure, that, 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 you know, uh, and percussion. And uh, yeah. Might be one of the things you noticed. Yeah. It was like lyrical, you know, kind of yeah. like after, maybe even after like some point in the lyric, you know, where, you know, a, a point was made. And exactly. Uh, there, she, she's, she's compositional like, like that. Mm -hmm. And she, she, uh, you know, all her tracks uh, have, lots of little thoughtful things in them that strike you, you know, hmm. and that you wish you had thought of. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't take a lot. And sometimes I think even if you do too many, they start to just that's true. get lost. Yeah, that's true. But little things like that, that kind of get you coming back and say, hey. Well, you're really good at that too. You make those sounds that I've never heard before. And I've heard a lot of sounds, <laughs> you know, when I, you know, when I hear the, the you know, the standard, uh, you know, wave station loop, you know, I say, oh, okay, that's the wave station loop, you know, hmm. and uh, with a lot of other sounds, I'm the same way. But would you do a sound? I, it, it's like uh, a discovery for me. Hmm. It's really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I'd like that. About that's why it. you make the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> that's why i'm rolling in it <laughs> you know i think yeah, all of us, yeah. what's um cool that you can do now is you can turn anything into sound and music mm -hmm. and we're all in a unique environment if we both decided to grab five things around us to make noise with we'd grab five different things and even right. if we had the same things in our room we'd grab a different combination mm -hmm. and i really like to lean on that a lot where like yeah i do have um you know the perfect piano in my daw but i kind of like my out of tune 100 year old piano for all the noises it makes and the quirks yeah. you know um that reminds me of listening to some of the wonderful songs that I fell in love with in the 60s um, before there was auto-tune and before there was easy digital editing because a lot of times it's the mistakes that you fall in love with mm. or the things that aren't perfect. And they, they provide human character. Mm. It's just like if you hard quantize uh, drums to me i immediately lose interest but if i it, it, even drums that have been randomized slightly so that it it's not really human but it imitates human imperfection all of a sudden my shoulders relax and i start mm -hmm. being able to really enjoy it mm -hmm. um but when i hear the perfection i I start getting, you know, mm. shoulders go up and the appreciation goes down. <laughs> <laughs> I think it also makes it so difficult to let anything else have feel too, because it's so locked in that if anything else is not, yeah, it, it just doesn't gel right. Yeah. I'm like you with those, you know, when like when I listen to Beatles recordings, right, where they're recording in the room and sometimes they yell something or something yeah. falls over and you can There's hear a it in the track. Famous, famous examples there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Where Paul that, fell on the piano. and yeah. <laughs> It makes you feel like you're with yells. them though. You yeah. know, and that would get edited away. It would. 
And I think even when we were in California, someone brought up, maybe it might have been Matt, he brought up the uh, intro of the police song, uh, Roxanne, where he sits on the piano and laughs. And well, maybe that's him. what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it was Sting who sits on the piano. Sting, okay, yeah. But yeah, there's yeah, ones with the Beatles too, where, you know, yeah. they shouting yeah. in their takes. Yeah. And, <laughs> but that could, that's so easily polished away now. And I know. I miss that. I miss that. I, I think it's uh it's charm it's you're in the room with them now mm. i feel the same way mm. so you got another track right i do i have another uh, collaboration and this is uh, a young lady <clears throat> named marina Toussaint, and she has a sort of uh a, a collaborator that she works with a lot named milena casado um Fouquet. And um, it's one of those Latin names where they they have so many names sometimes, but um, sometimes she just goes by two names, Milena Casado, and she's a flugelhorn player. They both went to Berkeley. Um, pretty sure they both went to Berkeley. I know Marina did because she was in my class. She was in my logic class, and um, it, there was this magical moment where she handed something in with her vocal on it and i listened to it and i thought oh my god that woman sounds like billy holiday only with a giant range hmm. and um see if you hear that in her um in in her in, in the way in her expression hmm. um because and and she also has this kind of quality to her voice that i always love which is a um this kind of texture a textured mm. voice you know mm. where where it's it's almost gritty mm. um but in but in her case it's just so beautiful mm. okay enough talk hang on a second that sounds nice yeah here we go once again she lives in barcelona so she did her parts all her parts in barcelona and and so did the flugelhorn player do you think and, that comes across on some level that it this song has traveled across the world? I don't know. Creation? I don't know. It's it's a standard. You know, it's yeah. like a, a a hit rec a, a hit song called Superstar that uh -huh. was a hit in the probably in this it was Bonnie Bramlett who originally did it. And it was interesting because when when I heard Bonnie Bramlett did it, do it, she didn't have the hit. Um the hit was done with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, um, and Karen Carpenter sang it. But Bonnie Bramlett wrote it, and well, when I heard Bonnie Bramlett's version, I thought, oh my God, nobody could ever do it better than that, hmm. um, because she killed it. But, but check it out. Listen to this.
Yeah, I know yeah. that song, uh, but from the Carpenters, and and actually right. even Sonic Youth did a really dark cover oh, really? of that. Yeah, so really like we, low yeah. dark cover. Yeah, John Troy played the bass on that. Uh, the guy you met, oh, your out friend, in yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, cool! A great bass player on that. And a guy named Todd Wolf played drums. Hmm. Was was I hearing like water or a rain stick or something going on in there? Uh, there was a, no, I don't think so, but there, uh, there might have been a, a synth sound that I put in. Okay, that was cool. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a nice texture, kind of deep. Yeah. yeah, that was great. And yeah, I see what you're saying with the voice. It's, um, first of all, like it's, there's like a little bit of almost sandpaper in there. And yeah, um, so she's all over YouTube, uh, but it's doing contemporary music stuff that you might find in Ableton or, mm. or uh, you know, um, you know, with a with a, con a hand controller, and um, mm -hmm. it, it completely, you know, different uh, genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the phrasing is really nice. Um, almost, oh, yeah. almost like a lazy to it little yeah, like that. behind the beat kind mm -hmm. of thing really mm -hmm. that sounds nice on a 6-8 feel makes it more yeah. dreamy it was Troy's idea to do the 6-8 hmm. yeah yeah really nice mm -hmm. so cool and that so that's just students that uh, caught yeah. your ear huh yeah yeah and I have a bunch of other stuff on my album at Peter Bell music.com Mm -hmm. um, just saying just saying yeah and there's a bunch of other student uh, vocalists on that okay nice really yeah I was wondering stuff. where they yeah. came from well some of them are old friends mm -hmm. um, and some of them are new friends mm -hmm. <laughs> students I never do it with anybody who's currently a student because right. that would you know conflict of interest type of thing conflict um yeah so i always wait until all the grades are in and <laughs> um then i think uh you know would, would it be cool to approach this person at this point and uh yeah our sponsor for this episode kits.ai has a few other cool features you can train it on your own voice and use that as a model I uploaded my voice and used the text-to-speech to create this short clip. Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Kits.ai can also separate vocals from music. You can upload your own tracks or even use a link to a YouTube video. I used my song My Heart Was Wrong from my album Rectangles. Here's what the track sounds like. And here's the backing track without any vocals, thanks to kits.ai. And here's the vocals isolated with kits.ai. These features open lots of creative opportunities for musicians. Try it out for free at kits.ai. It's great. It's, you know, community, right? Like it's so it important. Is. Yeah. I mean, we got a good taste of that a couple of weeks ago and we did. It's it made me more excited even to come back and play with the people I play with in my band, you know. Good. To like feel different in a way in a really refreshing way um it's if you're ever feeling like a dry spell in your music um find somebody to play some music with well the, you know what it brings to me is that it doesn't matter whether you're playing a wedding or whether you're playing in carnegie hall what matters is what's going on between you and the other people who are playing and the other people who were there, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's you know a lesson you know, I think we, needs to be learned over and over again, because we 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 lose the forest for the trees, you know, 
wait, how much money am I making? Or how many people are clapping? Or, you know, did they stand up? Did I, did I get an encore? You know, it, 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 it's all, uh, you know, stuff that we can't help wanting. Mm -hmm. I still want all that stuff, but I don't need it as much as I used to. Mm. And I, I think I appreciate the other parts of it. Isn't that kind of miraculous that I get to play with some other people that I like? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you can get that out of sports. Yeah, uh, you can get that out of work if you're lucky. Mm. You know, conventional job, but music is is just made for that. Mm -hmm. You know, like your friend. You know. Yeah. You know, even in teaching, um, I have done some collaborative teaching, and I, I do my two of my classes are they're called E and L classes. English as a new language, so it's usually people that are new to the country often and are learning English. And I do that with another teacher who's specifically an E and L teacher, and I'm the English teacher. <laughs> and a good lesson with her feels a lot better than a good lesson by myself. <laughs> yeah, even if same level same caliber it's because it's like that like yeah like we we got it you know and we we did it yeah. together here and That's there's cool. something you can share that i guess again you know but even teaching at all you know your students and you are collaborating yep yeah, that's that's how I see it. I tell them that right from the beginning. I'm like we're on the same yeah. team here. <laughs> yeah. And I grew up thinking it was sort of us against them as a kid, know. you know, in class. It's it's easy to think that. Yeah. But maybe for some teachers it is like that. But <laughs> oh, I had some teachers who were like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's <laughs> it's it's so much better the other way. <laughs> it sure is. I had some teachers who, you know, you know never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a lot like, of great teachers too. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it only takes one as well. Just somebody that yeah. can open your eyes to something or. Berkeley's a nice community. I mean, there's a lot of really good teachers <laughs> at Berkeley and there are a lot of very idealistic teachers at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, you know, nothing's perfect, but it's, mm -hmm. it, in general, I, I, I think it's a, a good place to, to study music. Uh, a lot of the people I know from there are awesome. Um, a lot of yeah, people we hung out with a few weeks ago were Berkeley in some way or yeah. another. Yeah. Um, people that I've had on this podcast, people that um, I follow online, mm. um, just lots of good energy and... Um, it's just encouraging. It's inspiring because I, th you know, for me as somebody that didn't go to music school and doesn't have that formal training, it can be intimidating. Like, sure. Because I'm, I think I know enough to know that I have a lot to learn. <laughs> you know that there's That's so the much. Test, right? yeah. yeah, I've at least gotten to that point where I can see like, holy shit, there's a lot of <laughs> depth to this. So, I've never felt. Um, you know, condescended to or, or no, anything like because that. Because when you come out the other side of all that stuff, it's not really the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And some of the, uh, some of the people that I've been fortunate enough to know, uh, don't use music theory. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for instance, Gabriela Montero, who's, uh, one of the premier um, classical pianists in the world, played at Obama's uh, inauguration and was my stepdaughter. And, um, you know, standing next to her while she performs on a piano is, is one of the craziest experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's otherworldly what she can do and yet she doesn't use music theory she can read anything but 
you know, at one point she was improvising, and I said, "I really like that mixolydian part that you did there." And she said, "Oh, I don't, I don't know what that means." <laughs> <laughs> that cool. <laughs> it's just, it's in the way for her. Yeah. You know, she, in the piano, was almost in, it doesn't exist for her. It, it's, hmm. it's just like this, this kind of connection to music that you know, is seamless. There's nothing in there. There's nothing to get in the way, you know. Mm. I think the piano was in the way at first, like a lot of our instruments are in the way at times, you know, because, you know, our, our brains are hearing things and we can't get our instrument to, to make that sound. And so 30 years of practice later, you know, if you're lucky, you can get some of it. And or maybe not thirty years, but ten, and and she got to where there's you know she can make any sound that she wants mm. uh, that a piano can do. And I I used to listen to her tapes of her when she was a kid um, that her mother made, and the strongest impression that I got of what she was doing was, okay, what can this thing do? You know, this this piano, what can it do? Hmm. I'm going to just find out. Yeah. Um, going uh, after it. It's just the uh, next exploring. level kind of thing. But, you know, but the, most most of us are human. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> and, and, and we do what we can to make sounds that are expressive and and communicate emotions. And there's all kinds of ways to do it. It's it's limitless. Well, I think you kind of have a little bit of this going where, um, if I remember correctly from what you told me, um, when you were younger, I think even when you were playing in, played with Bonnie Raitt, when you played with the James Montgomery band, um, that was kind of before your education in music. It was. So yeah, I didn't, kinda, I didn't go to music school until I was 30 or 28 or 29, 30. So you had a career in music, essentially. I did. Untrained. Yeah. Were you untrained? Were you, was it guitar I lessons? I was totally untrained. I, I wasn't really meant to be a musician. I, you know, um, I was, you know, I had a, deg I, I was headed for a degree in government. Hmm. And I was very alienated by the Vietnam War. I'm a baby boomer. I'm 75. And um, and so I I turned to music as an escape, and it's been a good escape. I, I made my escape. My escape. <laughs> I got away. Well, you had a very you had the path into government. Well, yeah, I've sort of had my career backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Do you, f how do you feel, um, I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to ask you, but I'm, what I'm trying to get is like this contrast of like yeah. playing more on feel and then actually getting the formal education that kind well, of. Well, I'm back to that. I'm back to that. You know, um, yeah, I think you have to go if you're, unless you're Gabby or, or somebody who is freakishly talented. Extremely um, rare. It's very rare. Almost and never happens. Most of us have to go through a stage where we are are really trying to to learn how to make the sounds that that communicate our feelings, and that's a lot of hard work, and it's worth doing because that you know that's that's actually rewarding in itself. I like playing the guitar. Mm. You know, um, I like it as much or more now than I ever did. Um, but for a while, I, I, I struggled with learning things on the guitar that, you know, were technical. And now I, I, I want to play things on the guitar that, you know, that transcend that. Hmm. Uh, Robin Ford said something cool in one of his videos. He said, when I'm playing the guitar, to me, it's like painting. He said, I'm, 
the, the notes that I play are like colors, and I'm just pushing them around. And you can hear it in his playing. His playing is fluid. It's relaxed. It's, it's, uh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, I don't play anything if I, unless I can feel it. And that's a pretty heady statement, you know, because we all have our licks that we go to. And, and uh, you know, I know how to, to play this thing, so I'm going to play this thing, you know. And it doesn't feel the same way every time you play it. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you can get in touch with how you feel right now, you're going to express that with your playing. Um, if you're lucky and you know, you, it's, it can be done intentionally. It's, it's something a, that you put in your mind and, and aspire to. Yeah. And it's a weird thing cause you, you almost can't think about it. <laughs> well, almost that's right. Yeah. If you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it too much, but right. Well, yeah, that's true. Sort of like riding a unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that, but <laughs> I can imagine it's one of those things well, as soon as you realize either, you're doing it. I can imagine, it, you know, yeah. once you're doing it, you can't think about it too much. Yeah, right. As You'll soon as you over. realize it. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when my father taught me how to ride a bicycle, we were going around in a circle. And then all of a sudden I looked up and he wasn't there. Hmm. He was holding on until he wasn't. And then, you know, of course, as soon as I saw that he wasn't, I fell over. <laughs> right. But when you thought he was, yeah, I when think I, I had a when similar I experience. Was, I was riding perfectly. <laughs> yeah. I can remember my younger sister, too, learning to ride a bike. She was just terrified of it. But she had these training wheels, and we'd watch her ride the bike, and the training wheels weren't even touching the road anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you don't need them. No, no, I need them. And then I think we were going around the block and they fell off. One of them fell off. Maybe my dad like loosened the screw or something when we weren't looking. <laughs> That's sneaky. But when it fell off, it, it was just like, you're doing it. <laughs> like, that, yes. Yeah. You need this sort of trust or something in yourself. You do. The music is a lot like that. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, did it change you as a player? I've gotten this question a few times from people that say, I want to learn the theory, but I don't want to lose my style or my feel. Yeah. Or I think temporarily it did, yeah. Um, I, I was learning a lot of theory, and it took me forever to actually put the theory into my playing hmm. because it didn't sound good to me. So, but now I, I, yeah, I've incorporated a lot of it into my playing because I found the parts of it that make sense with my aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I do use it. And the, the thing is that the, the theory is a shortcut. It, um, it's sort of like memorizing the alphabet or you know, learning to read words, um, you could get through life without knowing how to read, mm -hmm. but um, words, that is. Um, but it, it definitely helps as a tool. So I'm not so talented that I don't need it. I need theory in order to do some of the things that I do. And I, it, it gives me a, a, a hook to hang my hat on. You know, I, I know where I am in the song. I know why the song has a chord that leads to another chord. So I can lead to that other chord from that first chord in a way that makes sense to me, both as an emotion and theoretically. Mm -hmm. And I know the notes that are gonna sound like they belong, and I know the notes that are gonna sound like they're a little bit farther out than that and then the notes that are going to sound really far out. So it's, it's you know, I can, I can sort of predict the level of tension and the, and the, you know, which is basically what you're always doing. You know, when, when, you, when you write a chord progression, 
you start at home and then you go a certain amount of uh, certain you go around the block you go down to the corner store and then you come back home and then you you know sometimes you go to the corner store and then you go somewhere you know really far away and then you really need to come back home so there's these levels of push and pull where you're you're feeling like oh i need to resolve or i can go farther and farther off and mm -hmm. depending on what you're used to listening to is what your comfort level is with those kind of decisions the the, the level of tension and the level of resolve so as children we like triads three-part chords and um, we like simple melodies that stay in a single scale. And as we get older, um, we want variety in the sounds that we hear and more variety in more richness in the harmony that we use. So we start using four part chords and then more variety in the, in the harmony and, you know, getting from one place to another. And so, I think of it as not, you know, one thing isn't better than the other. They're just different. Mm -hmm. So I, the, some of the best music that, that really speaks to me that I've ever heard is one chord or three chords, you know, and, and also some of it is like really, really complicated jazz, you know, but when, when you first hear jazz, if you're 12 years old, it, you know, for most people, it all sounds the same because you can't discern what they're doing, right? But as you learn more and more, your, as your ear can accomplish uh, more and more understanding, then you, you start to appreciate the subtleties, mm. all right? So, you know, I, I know what, what that... Uh, you know, that feeling is, if I go to Berkeley, am I going to sound like every other Berkeley guy? Am I going to sound mechanical? Am I just going to be playing scales? Well, nobody who goes to Berkeley wants to sound just like they're playing scales, you know, mm. but they want to learn what's out there so they can choose. And some people achieve it and some people not, not so much, mm. <laughs> but that's like, you know, uh, you learn to play some things on the guitar and you'll probably learn some more things on the guitar as you get really used to those things and they turn out to be not enough for you. And d depending on whether you're interested in it, you'll, you'll, you'll keep going, mm -hmm. you know, but as I say, some of the stuff that I liked, you know, when I was, 10 or 12 when i was 10 i liked ray charles i still like ray charles hmm. you know I, I i i like uh you know john lee hooker who plays basically one chord boogie mm -hmm. you know that still does the same thing to me that it did when i was 12 or 15 you know i like james brown hmm. You know? I listened to that record you told me to listen to, the Live, oh, at, the Live at the Apollo. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, so, I know. I mean, that's just like... So I told my son the other day, I, th I think that that might be the best album ever made. James Brown, Live at the Apollo. Right. So that's totally subjective, of course. You know. Well, we were but talking about capturing a What it means to me. What it means to me. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, what does it mean to you? Well... I used to go see him play when I was 15 in Washington, D.C. And at the end of the show, I'd be drenched in sweat. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's not such a big deal now. Everybody gets drenched in sweat at shows, but <laughs> in, those, in those days, it was unusual. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah they, they before mosh pits. and <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It was just like, you know, I loved it. Well, you can hear it. I mean, it is. it sounds like the most exciting place in the world to be. That's what it was. That's what it was. And yeah. there's, like, I guess a really great example of just so much of what... There's the technical side of music, of course, 
but then there's the energy and the emotion and right. it is just dripping in that emotion. Yeah, it's, it is. And it's back and forth between him and the crowd and they're yeah. right with him and he's right with them. Yeah. Magical moment in time captured. Yeah. I'm glad you I'm glad you hear it the same way I do. That's neat. Yeah, I mean I, I don't know what it's like to be there, but Well when you, you hear it you're kinda like You're describing it. You just described it. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. You mentioned you, you have an aesthetic. You said like, you know, that works for me, that works for me. Do, is that something you can put into words what that is? Boy, is I it... think that's really hard. I would say that the music that I like has a root. Uh, it, you know, it's there's a there's a kind of a <clears throat> a pat uh, you know genre description of roots music, you know, but but it is. It, it, I I think I like uh, I like bluegrass. I like old country music. I like um, blues. I grew up loving blues. Still love blues. Um, I love country blues. I love city blues. I love sophisticated blues. I love jazz blues. I love blues. Hmm. Um, to me, I love it when people are playing other kinds of music and they put in bluesy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it, it, there's something about that. Hmm. You know, I, I think that the blues came up when European harmony was played for slaves who were forced to go to church and they sang over that European harmony, those major triads, they sang the, the oral tradition that they had grown up with, which was a minor pentatonic scale. And so those, those minor notes over a major triad are the basis of rock and roll. Mm. They're blues. That's what blues is. And you've got a dominant seventh chord. So you have both a major third and a minor third. Because you, if you want to get technical, it's, kind of everything it's in sharp, between too. sharp nine. It's sharp nine. <laughs> sharp okay. Nine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, it's like when I went to Berkeley and they started giving me names for all this stuff that I, you know, I used, I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to know this. <laughs> 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 yeah right it's, yeah there's like a formula to it it's like mm. yeah i mean i knew how to play these chords and they had yeah. they gave me the names i didn't know what they were called mm -hmm. but i didn't know you know very much and i learned a lot so i'm glad i did it for me as i say yeah for some people who are more talented they don't need it mm -hmm. i need it i i find it endlessly fascinating um and i didn't get a lot of it earlier um especially when you look at modes like why yeah. do we call you know this g mixolydian why well, it's the who same, cares what you call the same it. notes yeah. as what c major right so like yeah why isn't it just c major you know but but it's different it, it sounds different if you start on the d instead of the 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 c Right. Yeah. And, and that's what it came down to, I think, is just almost not listening, but feeling. Just what is the feeling I'm getting here? That's what it, each, each mode has a completely different feeling. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I would recommend you doing on the keyboard is start each mode on C. So play a C major scale and then play a C Dorian scale and think of it as the alterations from the C major scale. So it's one, two, flat three, four, five, natural six, flat seven, one. That's Dorian, right? And, and keep playing the modes that way. And then you'll, you'll get the different mood because you're in, this, the, in that same C head. Yeah. I've yeah. done that with just putting a drone on yeah. the C or A or whatever it is. And yeah. then playing guitar over that and being like, okay, 
I feel it now. Yeah, that's a great it, thing it keeps to do. Me home. Play the drone and then play a bar chord on the guitar and then play it a half step up and then another half step all the way up the neck hmm. and see what the feeling is. Hmm. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it gets colorful, I can imagine, especially. <laughs> I mean, well, it's, some of them sound really weird. Some of them are really tense, right? <laughs> right, and some of them sound like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, if I kind of listen with, sounds cheesy, but like listen with your heart in a way where. No, that's not cheesy. You, you're, um, even notes that are not in the key, I can play sometimes if I'm. And I don't always understand why I get to play that note, but it's because it has that kind of like naughty feeling when I go to that note, or it well, has there like you a go. I mean, that's, feeling. Yeah, <laughs> that's see, that's what's important. Mm. the The rationalization is not important; it's the feeling that's important. So, yeah. if you get that naughty feeling, go with that. You know, <laughs> and you know, if somebody says to you that's the wrong note, you can just say, "No, it isn't." It's Not if I play exactly it twice. What I want. That's, that's, <laughs> there's, there's no wrong notes. Yeah. There's only notes you want and notes you don't. Right. And it is amazing what just repetition does for a wrong note. <laughs> well, that's true. You can uh, another thing that you can do from a, you know, from a standpoint is that uh, if you move it up a half step or down a half step, it's probably a right note. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So you can make it sound like you did it on purpose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I found that a lot with just bends on the guitar strings, you know, where yeah. I can actually start on the wrong note if I get up to the right note. That's and, really and, true. And there's some, I, some some weird feelings you can get that way. I I, I had a, I knew a musician once who said he didn't like BB King. He said he plays out of tune. And I said, what do you mean he plays out of tune? He says when he bends notes, he says he's not in tune. And I said, but that's because he doesn't want to be on one of those half steps. That's why he's bending it, so he can get in between. Yeah, right. And that's the point. The feeling that he wants is in between those notes. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. they, well, the, even some synthesizers now have some, like, micro-tuning things sure. you can play with. And you can get some, like, really bizarre. Some of that's over my head. I, I, I've had some students who have passed in projects where they're they're using uh micro tune and uh it takes some getting used to because yeah. you know when you first hear it your instincts are no no wrong 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 right and then you realize that the, it's just a matter of getting used to it and sometimes you get scared oh what if i get used to everything and everything will just sound bland and <laughs> you know nothing nothing will will give me that charge you know yeah. and uh you know that hasn't happened yet you know i don't think that's the danger um yeah i heard an interview with keith richards where he was talking about the guitar and he's like it's a puzzle man every day i find a new piece you know it's like <laughs> he was just talking about how it's just a never-ending thing it's like it's one of those things like uh like playing a sport like you said doing a martial art there's no yeah. finish line even the martial art you get your black belt and then the, you, there's that's when the training really begins they say right right well that's what we said right you and i both agreed that it's the journey not the destination yeah the journey is the thing yeah right because uh where are you expecting to get <laughs> and then when you get there it, the goal post changes you know every well, time you, yeah. you accomplish th something th think of all the, the the people who or you know we talked about this too think about all the people who thought when it, uh, if i only could get rich and famous i would be happy and they were so miserable when they got rich and famous that they they anesthetize themselves to the point of of killing themselves. Mm. There's a list yeah. a mile long. Right. Um, so it's an illusion. Yeah. And I, I'm not saying I know, you know, some sort of answer to that, but I, it it is kind of an impressive thing when you when you look at it. You know, there's probably some rich and famous people who are happy. And they probably would have been happy whether they were rich and famous or not. Right. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. I listen to um, Sam Harris has a an app called uh, Waking Up. It's a it's a meditation app, but it's so much more than that. It's not just meditation. It's people talking, it's theory, Buddhism, and lots of really cool stuff. It's cool. it's a wealth of information. Uh, but he often says this this phrase something up to the lines like you don't have to wait to be happy like you don't yeah. have to have this happen or that happen like you right. it happens now and and think of all the things that you have now that you right. at one point in your life wanted and right. now you've grown used to them and the goalpost moved like now you need something else and it's a, a good reminder. exercise. You know, I, I wish that we could tell ourselves how to feel, but we can't. Yeah. But if we did, if we could tell ourselves how to feel, we'd probably like slap ourselves in the face and say, what's wrong with you? All day you long. Hey, Everything's hey. fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All day long. I'll do it for you if you do it for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Step out of it. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't have to look far to, you know, you, trade p problems with someone else you'd be glad that's to it. have yours back yeah and uh, oh that's for sure a lot of our problems are good problems to have <laughs> i know they really are all right so we did a lot of collaborating at the retreat a few weeks ago but collaboration has been a big part of your journey as i understand pete yeah especially with my production partner david mash who uh, is the guy who began the electronic music department at Berkeley College of Music. And uh, he eventually rose to be the um, executive vice president of the college. And uh, he's a futurist, and he had a lot to do with the direction of Berkeley College. He's retired now, but um, he and I work together a lot. Let me show you his uh, our, our mutual website just uh, briefly. I'll share. Very good. And you know that was that's so important too that this uh, the electronic aspect the um, digital instrument stuff that uh, Berkeley like now allows you to have MIDI controllers and computers and laptops as your instrument of focus, which I think so many music programs kind of shun that stuff and stay very traditional. And it's just really nice that that. <laughs> It direction really has been embraced so much by berkeley it is and and it's all due to dave mm -hmm. to be honest with you because um now an incoming student not only has to have a mac but also has to have a midi controller hmm. and um so the, and there are required there's a technology course which is required called uh music tech or m tech 111 which is populated from all over the course with everybody in all the different disciplines. Um, but they have to learn to do basic uh, sequencing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for some of them, they're already way ahead. Others of, of them go kicking and screaming, but it's good for them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good way to kind of cross pollinate too, right? Since it everybody's is. Going it really, it. it really is. Um, yeah, Cause I know in many schools you get kind of siloed into the thing you're doing after a while. And to you do. And, th exposed. and this is a chance for students to be taking a course with, um, other students who are in all the different, uh, uh, majors. Right. So they meet, uh, people that they wouldn't necessarily meet in their own, ma uh, outside their own major. Right, open this. So this is this is our website that we have together called Bar of Two Productions, which is our thing. And uh, essentially, we each have different styles. Um, Dave does a lot of his own uh, productions with mostly with MIDI instruments, but uh, with with some uh, acoustic sound source instruments. Uh, and, when, and then we get together on the mixes. And, mm. uh, you know, I do mine with some midi but uh more acoustic uh instruments and uh most of the collaboration we, you know sometimes we help out on each other's arrangements uh quite a bit actually sometimes so this is this is a you know if you're interested in finding out more about us this is a good place to go barf2.com and there's a video here of uh, one of my tunes and a video of one of Dave's tunes right on the front page there. So I just wanted to, 
to touch base on that. Dave Mash has been an important um, collaborator in my journey. Hmm. And um, uh, he, uh, he sort of led me into um, becoming uh, more focused and more expert on electronic production. Sounds like an important part in a lot of people's journeys now then. He is. Very yeah, nice. Been. And it is. Yeah. Including so, yours. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I have something to owe to him as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll definitely put that in the show notes, barv2.com. Terrific. Thanks, Brian. I would be, uh, it would be wrong of me not to ask you a little bit about um, just I, I I would just love to hear the story again about when you first met Bonnie Raitt and just what oh. that was like. Uh, you know, it was, uh, a, it was a kind of a cool story. Um, I was playing my guitar and singing. I'm a terrible singer, but I was I was trying to be a singer and and playing my guitar in a in a bar in Cambridge um, called Casablanca, and this was probably around 68, 69. And, and a woman came in and she said, I have a, you know, I have a bar room in Somerville, which is the next town over. And I would like you to come and play there, you know, and I'll, I'll put a notice in the paper. Maybe we can draw some people from Cambridge over there. And I said, um, you know, I don't think I can draw anybody, but I'll be glad to come and play. And, you know, in those days, uh, a, a standard uh, fee to to pay someone to come and play for the night was fifteen dollars, and uh, way more than it is today. <laughs> <laughs> well, in those days, you could buy a brand new Volvo for thirty two hundred dollars. So, fifteen was a lot more than it sounds like. It probably like a hundred bucks now. So, um, yeah, or maybe a hundred and fifty. I think a factor of 10 is pretty close. So anyway, um, I showed up at her bar. Um, she was, um, kind of liked her. Um, she was really tough looking though. And I heard the backstory from other people that she was getting divorced from, from a guy who was, uh, you know, a shady guy who was a, a mobster. And he was as, as the as part of the divorce settlement, he gave her this bar, and um, so you know I sat down with her at the bar and, and we talked about. It. She said, "I'm going to put a notice in the you know whatever the, the the Cambridge paper was then. Uh, it was before the real paper. I think it was called. I can't remember what it was called, but anyways, um, so her son came in." And, um, you know, they talked and I, I gathered that he was her son and I could, I could see that he had a drug problem. He had tracks all the way up and down his arm. So it was, you know, pretty funky scene, right? And then this other guy comes in off the street in Somerville and starts screaming at her. And he starts screaming and he said he saw an ad that she put in the paper that listed her bar as being in Cambridge. So the bar is right in the Cambridge Somerville line, these two towns. And he was from Somerville, so he was terribly offended that she was claiming to be in Cambridge. And he started yelling at her, This is Somerville, it's Somerville, screaming at her. And she just looked at him like, You have no idea who you're yelling at, you know? <laughs> and I I was thinking, I hope this guy, you know, gets yelled out and, and leaves before somebody does something to him. And he did. So anyway, so we fixed on a date. It was like a Thursday night or something like that. And I show up to do, 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 do with my, my, um, my Martin D28. And um, there was nobody in there. And um, except for this red-haired girl, right? And I, I go over near the stage and she, she's sitting near it. And I see that she has a guitar as well. And so uh, I, you know, introduced myself and said hi. She, she said hi. And she said, oh, were you supposed to play tonight? And I said, yeah, I, I was. And she said, well, I got hired for tonight too. So um, she said, why don't we both play? 
I'll play for a while and then you play for a while. So she took out her guitar and I think she the first song she played was um, um, Since I Fell For You. But it might have been Angel from Montgomery. Anyway, I mean, my jaw hit the floor. Mm-hmm. And it was Bonnie Raitt and she was just as good as she is now and has always been. And uh, I was amazed. Um, I didn't know what to do. And she said, why don't you play for something? And so I played. And then we played together because we both like blues. And uh, and then, uh, you know, I don't know how many months later, I drove her out to uh, Minneapolis and uh, to make her first record. And I played on that with Junior Wells, who's... Uh, uh, part of you know Buddy Guy and Junior Wells and and uh, A.C. Reed, who's Jimmy Reed, the great blues artist, his brother who played saxophone, and this wonderful band uh, Willie and the Bumblebees, mm-hmm. and we played, uh, we made the album on a four track, a Crown four track, um, in a barn, on uh, on Lake Minnetonka, and uh, A.C. Reed and, and Junior Wells and and one of their friends who was their driver coming out. Actually, they came out in two Cadillacs, uh, light blue and, and light pink, and uh, from Chicago. So cool. <laughs> um, and they spent most of the day uh, in a boat uh, on the lake fishing and um, drinking scotch and milk in, out, of a, uh, uh, <laughs> out of a thermos. And... I asked them, I said, why do you drink scotch with milk? And they said, we have ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a hangover coming just thinking about that. Oh, they, they were way beyond the hangover station. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I can laugh about it. I, I you know, I, I, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I, I haven't had a drink in uh, 16 years. Hmm. So Nice. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you getting around 17 yeah hmm. so I, I I don't necessarily think that it's uh, a good idea to th- think that drinking scotch and milk is really funny but it was pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> well I think the whole package right the Cadillacs the fishing oh it was perfect you know it's, oh, they uh, were so and they were so sweet to us you know like yeah. these these white hippies you know didn't didn't know up from down you know and they really knew the music that we loved hmm. and uh, had been part of its development. So, and they were really nice to us hmm. and played on the album. And of course, they were just as knocked out by Bonnie as, as everybody else. Hmm. You know, she, she had already gone on tour. Her boyfriend um, <clears throat> was a guy named Dick Waterman who, um, managed a lot of blues acts, and he, I think at the time, was managing Buddy and Junior, and, and they were opening the show for the Rolling Stones uh, um, in Europe, and she went along on that tour, hmm. and so she'd already, you know, she was playing in the dressing room, and Mick Jagger came in, and he said, you're unbelievable, hmm. you know, you got to make a record. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool uh, endorsement right there. Uh, so that was that story. That's amazing. Yeah. And isn't it cool how the language of the blues, you know, allowed you guys to play together, you know, just it meeting. Is cool. It is cool. Yeah. It is cool. And, and it was an honor for us to be allowed to play with them. Hmm. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I know I've had you for a long time here, and I think you said there's uh, uh, a movie and a pint of ice cream in your future that I don't want to get in the way of. (laughs) I really enjoyed it, Brian. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for everything. I mean, it was really a a pleasure getting to hang out with you, and I'm glad you and I got a chance to room together and spend that little extra time. Let's keep it going. Let's keep the journey going.
I, I hope we do, yeah. Okay. And we should tell people maybe to go to、um, peterbellmusic.com, right? Yeah, if they're interested. Yeah, I think so. And, you, and your book, we didn't talk about that, but we should, we should mention it. The、uh, yeah. oh, creating yeah, commercial music. If you're interested in making music for, for commercials. Yeah. It's called This, Creating Music for Advertising. Yeah. So.、Um, Get on it if you're interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. And thank you to everyone that's listening. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The Five Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also the Music Production Club. Where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.